It's my name, we have quorum, and the faithful are here after the party. Uh, those of you who are observant would have probably noticed that the talk was built under Mark Seaman, and uh, in a classic quantum joke, you have now observed him and he's collapsed into me. I'm John Azariah. <laughs> I'm a principal architect for the Microsoft Quantum Team, and uh, I'm here to give you guys an introduction into quantum computing. So is it safe to assume that there are no professional quantum computing people in the audience? I would say so, that's fine. Um, strangely enough, I'm not a professional quantum computing people. I'm, I'm a software engineering person. I helped design the language that I'll be speaking about and so on. Um, there are very few people who are actually doing stuff with building new quantum algorithms and so on. It is an exciting uh, area of emerging research. And in some sense, part of this initial talk is to tease out why that is the case and what relevance this has for us going forward. So hopefully, you should walk away with this um, general sense that there are a few uh, interesting things to um, really take note of. There's a bunch of hype going around, so some of that might be dispelled by, by information you receive in this talk. Um, but hope, I hope to be um, communicative. This is a small enough group that, you know, feel free to ask questions and so on uh, if, if you want me to go slower or whatever. Um, <clears throat> all right. So this is the broad outline of the talk. We're going to figure out, you know, why quantum, what's so strange about it, where can we use it, how do you actually build something with it, and how do we get started? I mean, this is roughly what this talk is about. Some time ago, um, a few thousand years ago, we started to count. And we landed up using marks on cave walls. And then we came up with the first sort of manual computer. Um, and people could be fairly fluent with that. You could you get people to do you know, tens of computations a minute, maybe even hundreds of computations a minute if, if you were sustained. And then you could do like your accounting on an abacus if you wanted to, yeah. Fast forward to the 20th century and we are now at a point where we can do a few teraflops, petaflops. And if you think about the scale of change, it's probably between seven to 10 orders of magnitude, seven or, seven or eight orders of magnitude. It's not really much more than that. That's a phenomenal increase if you think about how many operations you can do per second going up by a factor of six orders of magnitude, seven orders of magnitude. So it's actually an incomprehensibly large number, right? What I want to show you is that in, in the quantum world, for specific applications, and not across the board, but for specific applications, you're going to get orders of magnitude in terms of capability of computation that are much, much higher than six. There are going to be situations where we're going to see uh, I'll give you an example in a minute, where the, the computation that would take billions of years can be reduced down into um, you know, a reasonable, tractable period of time. And so there's, there's obviously a lot of hype around this. The first message, in some sense, to counteract the hype is to realize that this kind of speed up is not universal. You're not going to be able to get the speed up for every, every application. Not everything is going to become faster with a quantum computer. But there are some things that will become faster in a quantum computer at such a large scale that it dwarfs the you know, currently incomprehensible leap that we've had to take between counting on our fingers and counting on a supercomputer, right? So here's an example of one of those problems. So this problem, uh, if you try to decompose those, that number into the two primes that actually, when multiplied, form that number, um, you, you could have netted about $700,000. This was actually a, uh, a challenge problem that was given a few, a couple of years ago, all right? Um, the challenge is no longer there, not because they've solved it, they just, you've, it's not, it hasn't been done within the time frame, right? And there's a reason why that challenge actually was worth a lot of money. Um, because classically, that 
problem takes about a billion years to solve on a, on a standard cluster. Not a single computer, but a whole cluster of computers. And the idea that we're trying to uh, apply quantum computing towards is to, to basically accelerate that. And this factorization problem is a specific example of one of those cases where you can actually get a really good speed up on. So if you think about the orders of magnitude between those two, you'll realize that that is a very, very big leap. Why is this the case? Well, the way in which computers have actually accelerated and evolved over a period of time has been due to Moore's law. We all know Moore's law. We know everything doubles every so often and so on. And we've kind of leaned on that for some time. And so in 2003, so if you look at the number of bits, 2,000 bits, uh, if you look at the problem, the 2003 cluster um, was actually well beyond a billion years. You couldn't solve this in a billion years, right? And the 2018 system kind of moved the needle a little bit to the right, and the curve looks the same, but shifted to the right, and so it inter intersects with the, the RSA 2048 problem at a billion years. That's a, actually a relatively good speed up. It's just not necessarily useful, right? Quantum computing isn't going to move the needle further that way. The, 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 it's not about getting a better Moore's law. It's not about making um, Moore's law work faster. It's about changing the way in which you do the computation. So uh, a standard quantum computer would probably do that. And that's a slow one. Uh, one megahertz one is probably something that we will do in my lifetime. And we should probably be able to get that kind of a curve. So if you notice, there's a huge difference between the way in which the curves are actually shaped. And the reason for that is because it's a fundamentally different computation paradigm. And of course, when you speed things up, it actually just keeps the shape and moves down. Now, before everybody goes off and shorts Bitcoin and, and starts believing that you know, the whole of the economy is, is, uh, is going to be broken because RSA you know, is vulnerable, the second hype I should just address and move on is that <clears throat> not only are there quantum resistant crypto algorithms available, they're available today, and this kind of speed up won't help in the, in, when you use those schemes. And the second thing is, in order to solve the RSA 2048 problem, you're going to realize that we're going to need an extraordinary amount of hardware, and we're nowhere close to getting anywhere close to that. And in fact, I hope to impress upon you that as we go through this talk, that we will see a lot of positive applications of quantum computing well before that, before we start seeing this kind of uh, uh, change. So this is not forthcoming anytime soon. You don't have to, to panic. Uh, however, if you are in, in the process of writing software that will last 30 years, it's wise to consider quantum resistant crypto algorithms and start integrating them in now, because they're actually available already. That's the second takeaway that I would like you to have. So this thing over here um, is the pride of the US at the moment. We now have the fastest supercomputer in the world back in the US uh, after almost a decade and a half in China. It's an extremely powerful machine, um, probably much bigger than this room, and it can do all kinds of very, very cool things. And it can also um, analyze my favorite molecule, right? So for those of us who partied hard yesterday, this is why we are here, caffeine, right? And the problem of actually analyzing caffeine turns out to be computationally hard, computationally ex expensive. What does it mean to analyze a molecule? Well, I'll digress a bit here and hand wave if you, if you don't mind. So a molecule is basically a bunch of atoms together that have been bonded, right? So people go all the way back to high school chemistry, you'll know that there's uh, covalent bonds and ionic bonds and all that kind of stuff. What is a covalent bond? Well, it's when two atoms are stuck together in a non-breakable way, and there's some energy of breaking that bond and so on and so forth. But what is a bond? Well, 
shared electrons that actually sort of merge together. And now at this point, you're getting into like, you know, university chemistry. And, and it's still not really clear what that is. But from a mathematical perspective, what it is, is an electron is effectively a wave function. And a bond is a wave function that is formed by adding two or more electron wave functions, right? The wave functions are not easy to compute. And we'll, t we'll see that in a minute. The wave functions for these electrons um, get quite difficult. And they get really, really difficult the moment you introduce metals into the mixture. And it gets to the point where every added electron into a system doubles the size of the problem. And caffeine has no metals and is relatively small. So a supercomputer of that size can actually handle the number of electrons in the caffeine molecule so that we can actually understand how the bonds are put together and why it behaves the way it does, at least in terms of its structure, if not in terms of its, uh, uh, you know, um, it's, it's potential of bringing joy to people, right? We don't, we, that's even, quantum computing can't do that, but we can understand why it behaves like it does, right? That molecule, on the other hand, is actually very, very important. And as you'll see in a minute, that's not even the whole molecule. That's just the core of the molecule. And we depend on that molecule every day. In fact, in, in the background, that molecule has probably fed you from the day you were born and will do so for the foreseeable future. That molecule is the core of a very interesting compound that is found in nature. And as we'll find out, to write down the problem of that molecule will take more atoms than we have on this planet. And now we're in a situation where it's not just a matter of Moore's law getting better or us getting better with the math. We can't even write down the problem. And yet the molecule exists. So clearly that is a wave function that has been solved. The molecule knows how to do this. And the, the insight that you should probably walk away from this is rather than look at it as I have a really, really hard math problem here to try and understand this molecule, if you flip it around, you'll realize the molecule is actually solving a really, really hard math problem, right? Because it exists. If there's some way where I can take another math problem and translate it in terms of this molecule, then I can use it to do the computation to figure out the solution. And that, in a nutshell, is exactly what quantum computing is. You're using quantum mechanical phenomena to actually help you understand other quantum mechanical phenomena except that this quantum mechanical simulation on a quantum computer is something that you can control. So in fact, this is the foundational insight that Richard Feynman came up with that said, hey, if we had a quantum computer, we would actually use it to simulate quantum processes because actually calculating those quantum processes is hard, right? So let's come back to this molecule. How many people here um, I, I know I'm in the Midwest. How many people here have ever had a garden? Have you ever planted beans in your garden? Do you know what the impact of that is? It enriches the soil, right? How does it do that? It does that by this process. So that is a, the root of a bean plant on your top left. And if you ever pull up a bean plant, you'll see that it has some parasitic nodules on the top of it. Those are not part of the bean plant, actually. They're just parasitic nodules. Inside the nodules, you'll find a little um, a bacterium called Nitrosomas bacter. And it does something which we spend an enormous amount of money trying to do. It knows how to convert nitrogen from the atmosphere and fix it into ammonia in the soil. This is an extremely hard problem to do. It's so important that you have to take it, look at it from the scale of human population. From 1911, when industrialized farming came into play, we have used the Bosch-Haber process to make ammonia. Ammonia is the most important industrial chemical made in the world. Humans spend 3% of our entire global energy 
budget, making ammonia. So from 1911 till now, if you've eaten anything at all that has been grown somewhere, chances are it was fertilized by something that was made industrially, and that fertilizer contained ammonia that was made using the bosch haber process, right? The bosch haber process is extremely energy intensive. You have to heat nitrogen to extremely high temperatures, put it under extremely high pressures, and then you'll end up getting a little bit of ammonia, and then you use that to actually do everything else. The bean plant doesn't do any of that. It fixes ammonia quietly at room temperature, atmospheric pressure. No problem. All you have to do is plant some beans, and you get ammonia made in, the, in place. Wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't there be profound implications if we were able to make that happen if we understood how the bean plant was doing it? I would say there would be, because now you have removed the energy equation from the food equation. From an economics perspective, this is a profound human impact. Here's the catch. You know that molecule I showed you? That's that bit over there. And that's the little bit in the middle of that big molecule. And it has two metals in it. And we can't compute its wave functions. In fact, as you'll find out, in order to compute the wave functions, classically, you will need the atoms of a million Earths just to write down the problem. So it's not just a matter of working harder. There's actually no way you can do this classically. But somehow it's already being done. So if we find a quantum mechanical way of doing it, then we could actually solve a really, really hard problem. And as you'll find out, we can actually solve this problem one order of magnitude cheaper than breaking RSA. So long before we come to the point where we can break RSA, we might actually solve this problem. We'll have the resources to do so. How does that work? How do you build an algorithm that does this kind of thing? Well, so we people at Microsoft basically started working on this kind of thing for some time. We've been, you know, Microsoft Research has been doing some quantum computing work for some time now. The key approach for building quantum code is to effectively do this. You find an algorithm that has a quantum speed up. That's not easy. There are only a couple dozen of these things available, and there are only a handful of them that actually show exponential speed up. Most of them show something called logarithmic speed up, which is impressive, but not that impactful. And it's not the same, it's not, it doesn't have the same impact as exponential speed up, right? But then once you have that algorithm, what do you do with it? Well, one of the key things that you'll need is to take that algorithm and actually write some code to implement the algorithm. But now you don't have a quantum computer to run the thing on. How do you actually proceed from there? Well, we can simulate a bunch of stuff, and then we can do things, very clever things, like resource counting. We can say, OK, if I had to run this program, how much computation hardware would I need? Well, you do this all the time in, classical world, in the classical world. I remember writing code and, and trying to figure out what is the memory budget of running this thing. So you run it in a simulator, and you say, oh, in order to run this, I need 64 gigs of RAM. right? You can do that now. So we have now to have some tools to put simulation in place. But now I have the simulation to give me some feedback. I can tweak the algorithm to make it better. And if I do that well enough, I might actually get something that when I do have the hardware, I can actually plonk it into the hardware and make it work. And that is, in effect, the, the approach that, that we, we're taking. Right? So this is actually a paper that was written uh, some time ago by, by, by a bunch of people. Um, you'll realize that there are uh, 57 spatial orbitals and 65 electrons. So there's 57 spatial orbitals that you need to actually encode. Um, when we did the calculation, so classically you can't do it. It's you know, 30, 34 billion years or something like that to, to make the thing work classically. So we said, all right, let's take the quantum algorithm and make it work. And we brought it down to 30,000 years, which is impressive, but not terribly useful. Right? I mean, that's, that's not really getting anywhere. Right? 
But then we started actually doing what I just said. We built the tools to actually do the computational analysis, the simulation, and so on and so forth, had massive reductions in the amount of effort, got better at the math, and now we're at the point where we can run it in a day and a half. That is tractable. And that is actually only going to require a fraction of the number of qubits that we originally started with. So we went from having uh, 10 to the 17 to 10 to the 10. That's seven orders of magnitude right there in just optimization. So if you think about the, the speed difference between calculating on an abacus and calculating on your Pentium or, or your, uh, your, your new chip, your i7 chip, that's the kind of speed up you got by just looking at the math before you even had a computer to get moving. So there's enormous potential, and we already have some tools to actually get started on this. And so this is a key message to take away. It doesn't mean that you have to wait until we actually have a computer to do something. You can get started now. So how do we get started? I'm going to put it to you that you have been doing some form of quantum computation all this while. You just didn't know it. Nobody ever told you. So I'm going to dispel the myths and make it sort of easy for you to understand that what you've been doing so far isn't actually all that much different from what quantum computing is. All right? So who knows what that is? Cool. That's an inverter. So in, a, in an electronic circuit, it's a sort of silicon function that takes 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. OK? So a single bit, it inverts the value of the, of the function. Now I'm going to put uh, a challenge out there. I'm going, to, I'm going to say that when you were taught this, when you were first taught this, you were told that this somehow is a logical abstraction over some electrical or magnetic phenomenon, right? So the presence of charge in a capacitor or the absence of charge, and then that's, a, that's your ones and zeros, and then you have some electrical manifestation of that. Who wants to deal with the electronics? Let's talk about the logical abstraction. Fair? Uh, and this happens all over the place. So if you look at CDs, and some of us are old enough to know what CDs are, you know, the existence of a laser pit or the absence of, uh, of one or the magnetization or the non-magnetization on a hard drive, the presence or absence of charge, presence of actual current. That was the abstraction level that we were moving away from in order to get to this thing, right? That was a sugar-coated lie. That's not the abstraction. The abstraction is actually fundamentally mathematical in nature. So if I'm, I'm going to give you two little vectors, here, and if you feel like this is too difficult, uh, you can think of zero as the vector that has one in the zeroth place, and one as the vector that has one in the oneth place. Easy, yeah? And what do you do with vectors? You multiply them with matrices in order to get other vectors out of them. So if you do that, a not gate looks like that. It's a vector that takes 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. Okay? So now it doesn't matter what the physical abstraction is. What's, what you're actually doing is linear algebra, but you've simplified it a little bit. So let's go back to the linear algebra for a second and see if that kind of makes sense. So I can now write vectors like this for all the four operations that you can do on a single bit. All right? And once I do that, I can make a NAND gate out of it. And we all know that once I do the NAND gate, every single circuit in the world can be expressed in terms of a network of NAND gates. So I've managed to tell you that you can build the entire framework of computation on just these linear algebra concepts, right? All right, so this is one bit. What about two bits, wise guy, this is what I hear you say. I'm going to introduce this concept of a tensor. And that's that little x with a circle around it. And when you tensor one vector with another, you get a larger vector. Now, if you think about what's happening here, uh, you have 0 times 0 giving you 1 in the 0th place. 
zero. So the math works, right? This is still, we're still in consistency land here. And I put it to you that actually the, the one on the right is actually very, very familiar to most people. You just have a different name for it. I'll show you what that name is in a minute, right? Just to labor the point, let's go to three bits. And something should become apparent to you now is that this vector over here is still zero, but it's zero in three bits, not zero in one bit. So that information is being carried along by the size of this vector, right? But also this vector is now two to the three times the size of the initial thing. So every time I add a new bit, I double the size of this vector. So you're getting a sense of why the vector spaces start to get large and why we want to stay abstracted away from them. So cool, let's uh, stay abstracted away from them. I'm going to give you some notation here. Let's call that first vector the zeroth vector. And I'm going to put that little funny hat on the side for it, right? I do the same thing for one. And now when I tensor it, I get back something that looks suspiciously like a bit string. So those of you who read binary, that looks like two. And indeed it is. So all you have been doing so far is you have elided the tensor producting piece of it and you've kept the inside of that vector on the right, the state vector. And that's actually your entire binary language is right there. So in some sense, we've come full circle, right? We took standard classical computing, moved it in linear algebra, introduced a bunch of scary concepts, did some math, and then we come back to bit strings. And you're like, why the hell did you take me down this garden path, right? And I'm coming to that in a minute. But up until this point, I haven't taught you anything that you didn't know already. You've already learned and used things this way, you've just not seen it in terms of the mathematics. So here's the, where the departure happens. So I'm gonna take that number that you have up there, the ones and zeros in the vector, and I'm gonna change them into complex numbers. Now, for those people who have forgotten or have repressed what complex numbers are, a complex number is basically something that has two parts to it, a real part and a complex part. So if you think of it as an xy plane, the complex part is the y coordinate and the real part is the x coordinate. And the x-coordinate is exactly what you always knew, the number line, right? You know this from grade three. You start with zero in the middle, and you go plus one, minus one, and all the way up to infinity on both sides. And every single number that you have ever met lies on one of these points on this number line. And if you go up, so you go up, say, five points, and then you go up two, you have this entire plane now that effectively acts as the complex number plane. So if I make the, the vector a vector of complex numbers and not real numbers, something really, really interesting happens. When I start doing this stuff, I land up with the same vectors. They're still zero and one, but I can do other mathematics on it. So for example, I can take a uh, parts of zero and parts of one and make a value out of that. Because now I can actually do linear combinations of these vectors. And that leads us into numbers that we can't represent with our binary system. That's kind of where the whole quant the quantumness of it starts becoming apparent. So you land up with these numbers that can be represented that make sense in a complex space that don't make sense in a real space, but th those values turn out to be actually the values that, you, that lead to quantum computing. So in effect, this is the point of departure. All you have to do is learn enough linear algebra to get your classical quant uh, computational stuff right, and then just flip from real numbers to complex numbers and look at the implications of that. And when you do, you'll actually land up getting all of quantum computing. So here's an example of something that is known as um, a superposed state where forget the one over root two in the beginning, but it's some combination of one and some combination of zero. 
And that gives you a state now that you can represent in this kind of a space, right? Now, if you want to do that, you land up getting something that looks like this. So every point on that sphere is a valid qubit state, a valid complex state, right? What we have been doing so far is only working with the North Pole and the South Pole. So in terms of our binary values, we have this huge sphere. Imagine that I held, held a beach ball over here and you had the North Pole and the South Pole. All of your classical computing was just the two values that, that was on the North and the South Pole. So you're flipping it up and down is your North gate and leaving it where it is, is is the identity gate and so on and so forth. But the rest of the sphere is actually valid values which you don't use in classical computing but you can in quantum computing. And now you, you can represent an enormous large number of values with the same thing. Whereas with a bit, you could only represent either whether you were at the North Pole or the South Pole. Now I have a state that I can represent, hey, I'm so many degrees away from the North Pole or so many degrees away from the center, the, from, from, the, from the equator. And I'll end up having this four dimensional space that I can play with. And the mathematics of that four dimensional space is effectively quantum computing. That's, that's all that, that it is. Now, what can you tell me about a beach ball? If I put a dot somewhere on the beach ball and I want it to move to another place somewhere on the beach ball, if I want to move the dot, what do I have to do to the beach ball? I simply rotate it. So all the operations that we used to have in classical computing was just flipping the beach ball from north to south. That's the only thing that you could do. Now I have an infinite number of rotations that I can perform on that sphere. So I have a greater control of the kind of operations that I can do to this state in order to compute more effectively. So I don't have to have this coarse sort of, this is the only thing I can do. I can now rotate it much more finely and do some interesting things with it. And in fact, you can have a lot more matrices that do these transformations. So the yellow one we've met before, which is the thing that basically flips north and south, but all of the others, now makes sense in a quantum computing world. And from, a, from that perspective, you can now have an infinite number of values that can be stored in a single qubit. That sounds like an enormous advantage, and it is. Except there's one catch. If you ask nature, hey, I've asked you to rotate this beach ball in this really fine way until I found out where the value of my result was. Can you please tell me what the result is? Nature will not let you look over a notebook and say, it's there. Nature will only tell you, does it collapse to a zero or does it collapse to a one? So this sort of interesting piece, you have these two complex numbers, you measure them, you will get zero with a probability and one with the other probability. And from a class, from a qubit that can have an infinite number of values, you can only get back one classical bit. And this physical risk restriction, it's not a matter of you having not looked correctly. This is a, a physical property of nature. The ability for you to actually query for the information of what the quantum state looks like has a measurable impact. It destroys the state of the system and returns a classical value out of it. And that basically is what makes quantum computing hard. Because now you can't just generalize to, I have this universe of spaces that I can work with. It's really about the fact that you can do all of this, but you're kind of doing it blindly. You're asking nature to do the thing for you. And then when you ask it, what is the value? It kind of gives you back just a hint. And you have to reconstruct your solution from the hint. All right? So uh, I think that's enough math for the moment. I, mean, I can give you one more piece here. We, we've met this guy before, right? Every time you add a bit, you double the size of the space. So who's seen this problem before? Right? You start off small, right? In a three or four 
place is down, it's all right, it's all well and good. And by the time you get to 50, that's an awful lot of rice. Right? By the time you get to 64, it's inconceivable how much rice you need, actually. And so it is with qubits. So up to 30 qubits, you can run them on my laptop. A reasonable laptop will actually give you the ability to do perfect simulation with these complex numbers and all those linear algebra operations and everything for about 30 qubits. 40 qubits, you need coin. You plonk down some money, you go onto Azure, you fire up a cluster, and you can get to 40 qubits in some time. It'll take you some time, it'll take you a lot of money. 50 qubits, now you need to be the size of Facebook. Like you need to write the problem down, the problem is the size of Facebook, right? So it, at this point, it's starting to become intractable. A problem that requires 50 qubits is actually going to become intractable to deal with. 250 qubits, 260 qubits, you run out of atoms in the universe. If you use every atom in the universe as a way to store one qubit state, you don't have enough atoms in the universe to do it. Somewhere in the middle of this is like about 150 qubits, and that's the number of atoms. Two to the 150 is the number of atoms on this planet, roughly. So when you go back to the, the interesting problem that I showed you about the molecule, you need about 170 qubits to make that happen. So you don't have enough atoms on this planet. You need two to the 20 atom planet-sized things that will give you enough RAM just to write the problem down. So the takeaway here is that the problem that you're trying to solve is actually something that is not tractable classically at all. Now, what is Microsoft doing? Well, Microsoft's building a whole quantum computer and everybody wants to know what we're up to and part of this talk will actually tell you some of that. But what's different about the Microsoft approach? To go back, let's go into a little bit of physics here. So in, in uh, 1930s, there was this chap, um, Ettore Majorana, who had done some maths and figured out that you could actually take an electron and treat it as two half electrons. That is to say, an electron isn't really, in, math, in mathematical terms, an indivisible particle. It actually is made up of two sort of quasi-particles that you can then interact with inter independently. Right? Why is this useful? Well, because when you want to look at the state of an electron, that is actually a quantum state. It can be in positive spin or negative spin or some superposition of them both. And if you try to ask the electron, what spin are you? It will tell you exactly one of two answers. I'm up or down, that's it. So it satisfies all of the physical properties of actually uh, being used as a quantum computation device. The problem is, electrons don't live alone. They're extraordinarily difficult to isolate. And when you try to isolate them, they're extremely susceptible to noise. And noise is effectively anything that has to do with interacting with the environment. So a stray photon from somewhere will change the state of the electron and you'll lose the information. So electrons, you can put them in one state, but the moment they meet other friends, like you know, they kind of get into the bad influence and then you land up losing the information that they carry. So the quantum information, but not very stable quantum information. So how do you make them stable? Well, I'm very pleased to see from outside the hotel here, um, you have a big railroad track that runs past the, you know, along the river, and you know, they have these really, really long trains. And trains are really good because if you look at the stability of, the, of everything except the caboose at the back and the engine in the front, the freedom of motion of every other piece is constrained between those two. So what if we took these electrons and tried to actually put them in a train and that would help us reduce the impact of noise. And so with a bunch of clever physics, we can do precisely that. And this is where the whole Majorana thing starts coming into being useful, because if you think about Majorana as halves now, 
every Majorana has two pieces, a real piece and imaginary piece, let's just call it that, right? And if you put them in a train, you know, the first R and the first I, and the second R and the second I, and they're all paired up and everybody's happy, but they're all in a nice little line. And now, if you say, put up the environment in some particular way, like maybe put a strong magnetic field in there or something like that, you actually get to swap the partners. So now if you look at what happened in the second one, the imaginary part of the first electron is now the imaginary part of the second electron. Everything got shifted out by one. And you have two dangling bits at the end. And they actually form an electron. So now what you've done is, in a very physical sense, taken two halves of the electron and split them across a large distance. And this makes them extremely resistant to noise because a photon won't hit both sides of the electron at the same time. In fact, the distance between those two can be as large as 10 nanometers, which is a very small distance. But if you compare it to the size of a normal electron, it's virtually you know, epic proportions. So you land up distributing these two halves over a great distance, and you build in an enormous amount of resistance to noise. That's the theory. So we found the Majorana particle in the lab. And in fact, the person who found the Majorana particle was knighted by the, the king of the, the, the royal family of, of the Netherlands and works with us. And this is now being scoped into a, a, a product. So if you think about the baked piece that we, which, which we were going, we saw this particle in the lab in 2012. And seven years later, we're looking at actually making it work as a real device. And I think that is actually a breakneck pace. So yes, there's a lot of work to be done, but we're making a lot of progress going forward. Well, what about other kinds of qubits? Well, as I pointed out earlier, a lot of the qubits that we have are very susceptible to noise. We have qubits now in, in the industry. And in order for us to make the qubits live long enough for us to do something useful with them, you have to do error correction. So you take masses of qubits and put them together and make one logical qubit out of many small physical qubits, right? But if your error rate is beyond a particular point, it doesn't matter how many qubits you put together, you still won't get a logical qubit that's of any value. So numbers of qubits don't necessarily mean a lot if you, uh, if you have to use them just for error correction. Our approach is a little bit different. We go with a smaller number of qubits, but with a lower error rate, because we build the error correction into the system. And ideally, at some point, we will get to the point where we have a large number of low error rate qubits. So that's the kind of roadmap for where we're going with this and the physics behind it. And every part of this problem is hard. So what does a quantum computer look like? It doesn't look like that. That's a fridge. It sits at the bottom of that thing. And the quantum computer actually lives. Remember how I told you that you needed to isolate the, the, the electrons from their environment? One way of doing that is to actually cool everything down to very, very cold so that you, you know, there's a lot of uh, stray movement has been removed from the, from the system, right? So you cool everything down. You cool it down to about 15 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. Um, how you get to 15 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero is, is, it, is a physics problem in its own right. And then you put the whole thing into this fridge, uh, which is cooled by stages. And if you think about the problem of that, you have a wire that now needs to be at one end of it at 4 Kelvin, which is 1,000 times hotter than the one below. And the other end has to be at 15, 15 millikelvin. And you need to be able to transmit signals without transmitting heat. That's an interesting physics problem too. And at 4 Kelvin, you need to be able to control the device that's actually under 15 millikelvin. That's an interesting problem. And then somewhere up there at 300 Kelvin, I put on a sweater. And we need to write programs that actually talk to this device. And that's an interesting problem as well. In fact, that's the piece of the interesting problem that I've been working on uh, for some time now. And logically, 
that picture was put there not just because it was a shiny device, is to show you that you're not likely to get a quantum computer in your basement anytime soon. Certainly not one in your pocket. You need to carry something around that's actually going to be able to chill something to 15 millikelvin. It's not going to happen. So the only logical way to deal with this thing is to put it in the cloud. Right? So you have some part of Azure that actually knows how to handle these fridges. You have people that are actually going to take care of the, the devices and so on and so forth. And you program them from your computer some way. So the logical model looks like this. You have a program that you write and you treat the quantum piece as a coprocessor. So just like you did with a graphics coprocessor, you wrote CUDA and you sent the graphics uh, computations off to the coprocessor to do the work on the chip, you would do the same thing here. Except that to send the quantum information, the quantum program to the quantum machine, you need to write it down somehow. And how do you write it down in a way that actually gives us the ability to understand and reason over the program. So the best way of doing that is to come up with your own language to do it, and that's effectively what q -sharp is. And that also gives us the ability to write all the algorithms that we know of today and publish them as just q -sharp libraries. So you can basically download the libraries, download the code, write your own little program, run it today against the simulator or under Azure, and then when the quantum machine is available, you have a program that you can then ship off to the quantum device to actually do what it needs to do. Um, so this is, in fact, the ecosystem that you can start working with. As of yesterday, or two days ago, I believe, at Build, we made the announcement that QSharp is now fully open source. The language is open source. The compiler is open source. Um, all of the information associated with the language is now open source. So you can definitely go out and start like tinkering around with the language itself if you want to. There's the, the tools available. We now also have, in addition to Visual Studio Code, we have uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So you don't need an environment to actually do any setup. You can just talk directly to the simulator and get started right away. You have local simulators to do Actual math, so you can go up to 30 qubits or so, or depending on how much computational resources you have. But also you have things like the resource estimation that will give you the ability to take a, a large program and run it, not necessarily get the answer, but tell, it would tell you how long it would take to run or how, how many qubits you would need and that kind of thing, which, as I showed you earlier, is a very important part of this puzzle. And we have a lot of libraries. The, the idea is that we will actually build more and more of these abstractions to basically allow you to use quantum computing without having to necessarily write the bits and bobs yourself. Right? So you have building blocks that are basically quantum algorithms that are already available for you to use. And the language itself is quite a nice piece of work, if I say so myself. It's uh, uh, heavily functionally uh, influenced, so it's easy to to to, to uh, understand, very simple, uh, and very familiar syntax. So you should definitely try it out. I'll show you some code in a minute. Um, and it's, of course, cross-platform and fully open source now. So you, can, you should definitely go and, uh, and check it out. How much time do I have? 10 minutes? All right, anyone want to see a demo? Let's do the quantum weirdness demo. Let me see. So I'm going to use Visual Studio Code here. And bring up what. So because it's a coprocessing language, uh, let me see. Is that big enough for you guys? Can you see? Or a little bit bigger? This is crazy. Because it's a, a traditional uh, co-processing type thing, you land up having to write a host program in some familiar language. You can pick whatever you like. You can write, this is C-sharp. You could write it in Python if you wanted. Uh, and this is just 
basically going to drive three tests, a single Hadamard test, a double Hadamard test, and an observed one. And uh, this should show you a little bit of the quantum weirdness as well. So I had to take you back to the beach ball for a second, right? Now you guys know basic concepts of quantum computing, so this is the short quiz I'm gonna give you. Let's start with the North Pole. Put a dot on the North Pole and do a rotation that takes that dot from the North Pole to somewhere on the equator, right? Now, when I measure this qubit, it is equally likely to be a zero or a one. So when I measure it, according to that calculation that I showed you, I should get back to the zero state half the time or get to the one state half the time. Is that fair? Sounds reasonable? Okay, so that's kind of like a quantum coin flip, right? So you take this thing, you put it in the middle, and then you get heads or tails half the time. That's where intuition stops. What happens if I then take this rotation and somehow do a double coin flip on the same thing? What do you think happens? So if I took a coin and flipped it, and I got heads or tails, and I flipped it again, I, what do you expect will happen? Do you think the first flip has any impact on the second flip? No. Those are actually independent uh, events. So you'll still get a distribution of heads and tails the second time around, right? The quantum coin flip, the second time you flip it, will unflip the first. So if you started with the heads to begin with and you flipped, you will come back to heads every time. Or you start with the tail and you, and you bring it down to the, the equator and you flip it again, you'll always come back to the, to the, to the tail, right? So it's a really weird kind of thing now because somehow the fact that I'm doing the second flip after the first one, they're, they're correlated somehow, right? So we say, ah, this is interesting. So what I'll do is I'll flip it and then I'll look at the coin to see where it landed and then flip it again and it should take me back, right? But the act of measuring that coin just by looking at it and then throwing away the result will make it look like you didn't flip it the second time independently of the first. So you'll end up having a really weird behavior. So let's take a look at that. So I'll show you the Q-sharp code. It's actually fairly straightforward, very, very trivial code. Don't worry about the driver. So there's your single Adamard. This is just a Adamard, and you're measuring it. Here's two. Adamards, and then I'm measuring it. And then there's one where I'm flipping the coin, measuring it, flipping the coin again, and then measuring it, right? This is the description of the problem that I just showed you. Let's see what happens when we do this. Uh, let me see. Uh, I'm gonna try and make the font a bit bigger for you guys. Right. So can everybody see that? And now I'm gonna do a .NET run on this. And what it's doing is compiling the q -sharp code, running it against the simulator on the local machine, and it says, hey, I started, I ran this a thousand times, right? I started with false, and I got false 525 times and true 475 times. When I start with true, it's also roughly half and half. That sounds like what we expect. And now when I do two flips, one after the other, every time I start with false, I went back to false. Always, no questions asked. And now when I observe in the middle, I go back to it being random again. Now I showed you the code. The code didn't do anything with the measured value. All it did was observe the state and that collapsed it somehow. And it brought it back to this random state, right? So there is a truism here 
right? I mean, if you look at the math, you can actually work out why it is that way and so on. And that kind of removes some of the magic of the thing. The reality is, and probably the last message I want to leave you with is, this stuff is completely non-intuitive. If anyone gets the sense that they fully understood it, they probably got something wrong, right? There's a sense of wonder. This is the first of many steps that you will take to see that the natural world, which is being simulated on this machine, isn't anything like what we expect it to be. But it's not random. It's actually not random in the sense that it's not indeterminate. It, there are good mathematical rules that explain why it behaves like that. And part of the journey of exploration is to actually figure those mathematical rules out and bend them in our favor to solve the problems that we want. And with that, I will say thank you. So this is effectively the, the demo. I just keep this there so that uh, if the demo doesn't work, I can walk through the slide. Uh, let me go back. That was important. So this slide gives you all the details that you need of how to get started. Uh, you can interact with the MSFT quantum team. You can interact with me. Um, the community is welcoming and inclusive. Uh, and more than what has been put up there is completely open source. So you can definitely go and get started. And one of these days, I'll get around to actually taking those quantum cartas and doing a workshop for people who might be interested. But that's it from me. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Oh, that's a good question. Let me repeat it for everybody else. The question was, how do you overcome the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? Um, the answer is you don't, actually. You cannot overcome the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And in fact, you don't want to. It is the uncertainty principle that gives us some of the benefits that we need. And so we, uh, we take advantage of the physics in order to make things work the way they, way they are. Um, I think that merits uh, a gift. There's one more. Anyone, any brave soul that wants to ask a question will get one. This is for you. You can come and pick it up later. I don't know who the sponsor is, but I was just told to give these away. Yes? OK, the question was, what is the difference between a quantum annealing system and a, and a gate model quantum system? Um, I can answer the question, but not in five minutes or less. Uh, I'll give it a shot. The gate model system effectively treats um, the quantum state as a space in a vector space and performs unitary operations on them. The annealing system effectively treats the quantum state as a wave function that it needs to find the lowest energy point for. And it does so by doing a whole bunch of other things. So there's uh, annealing operations that you can kind of do to try and find the lowest energy point of a system. Um, quantum annealing is something that you can actually do with a gate model system, but the other way doesn't work. Cool. Yes. Okay, so that's a great question. Is there an upper limit to the number of qubits that you can manipulate on a system? Research is actually wildly speculative at this point. Considering the fact that we have zero qubits so far, all told, right? The whole industry, everybody has, everyone who's actually announced a qubit has announced a qubit with a lifetime in the order of 10 to the minus five seconds. And that's being generous, right? So 
relatively useless for doing any real computation. So the, the, the things that you need to, if you want to do 10 to the 6 operations on a qubit, you're not going to do it with when the thing lives only for that long, right? So error-corrected qubits, logical qubits-wise, we have none. Nobody has any, right? Um, so what is the physical limit to how many qubits we can manipulate? Who knows? I mean, mathematically, there's no fund found foundational uh, principle that says it can't be beyond this number. Physics-wise, you can see that the problems are actually quite interesting, right? Because you need to somehow find a way of bringing information back and forth from this extremely exotic, cold environment. Um, and that's not easy because you know, the physics are actually moving an electron from down there to where you can signal it without actually tampering with the thermal stability of the 15 Ray Kelvin regime. That's a physics problem. So now that you have one qubit and so many wires and 10 qubits and so many wires and 100 qubits and so many wires, now all of a sudden you've got this huge torrent of thermal stuff that you have to deal with. Who knows whether what is practically feasible? Who knows what is theoretically the upper limit? Nobody knows. Cool. Thank you.